From small villages in sub-Saharan Africa to the bustling cities of the Asian subcontinent, from Latin America to China and Eastern Europe, people everywhere are striving to improve their lives. People seeking the same things, opportunity to learn, an identity and ownership that allows them to prosper, a chance to earn a living for themselves and their families, to use their imaginations, to take risks and possibly fail, but to increase their options and to reap the rewards if they succeed. Join us now to see what can happen when ordinary people have the tools to help themselves. Major funding for this program has been provided by the Barney Family Foundation and the Green Children Foundation. Somewhere on Earth, at this very moment, a child is beginning its journey through life. 250 babies are born every minute, 15,000 an hour, 132 million a year, each and every year. And among them may be the potential to cure disease, to reinvent the future, or to change the course of world history. Because people are the world's ultimate resource. Here in this small fishing village in Ghana, a child is being celebrated. This welcoming ceremony, Pojemo, or outdooring, is held only after the mother believes that her child will survive. Until today, her daughter has been considered a visiting spirit. Proud parents and friends are welcoming her into their world. Villagers are reminded that everyone must help raise and protect this child. This is the first time she has seen the outdoors. Family and friends introduce her to the sky, the earth, and the rain. This age-old ceremony is about family and community and a successful future. It's about the dreams of all parents for all children. Bortianor is a village of fishermen in the Ga region of Ghana. Their meager living depends on the sea and the weather. Joshua Corley has been fishing his entire life. His boat has been built by hand and his most prized possession, his outboard motor. He nets about $50 a week when the fishing is good. But schools of fish are not the only schools on Joshua's mind. His daughter, 12-year-old Victoria, has a dream to become a doctor. I don't know any school I hear me. Margaret Amamon is Victoria's mother. She collects the fish to smoke and sell later.
Joshua and Margaret are not alone in their hopes. The father's a fisherman, and the mother's, what do they do? And not alone in their determination. James Tooley is a professor of education policy at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in England. He studies schools in some of the poorest regions of the world, India, China, and Africa. The education minister of Ghana has invited James to study the situation here. Think of education as being preparation for adult life. And for these children, that means education can help lift them out of poverty, can bring them a better life than their parents have had. With help from the West, Ghana has built schools throughout the country, and it has made sure that girls, as well as boys, attend. Public schools are free, but overcrowded. Children attend class only four hours a day. There are 73 students in this class. Joshua and Margaret want something better for Victoria. Studying schools in developing countries around the world, James Tooley has discovered something remarkable. So you walk to the canoe. You'd be really surprised some of the poorest people on this planet are getting a far better education than you'd imagine. And, and why, why do your parents send you to this private school? What we found in my study was that in poor areas like this, the majority of school children are in private school. And these schools outperform the government schools at a fraction of the teacher cost. In this small village, parents are willing to spend much of their meager assets on education. When I first came to Ghana, I, I met with just astonishment, because private schools, they say, are for the rich, for the elite, for the middle classes. So the question arises, why are parents paying fees to go to private schools when they could get government schools for free? I think it comes down to probably two main reasons. One is, when parents pay fees, they demand more of the schools. The second reason is that the schools themselves are accountable to the parents. Today, Victoria is going to school, a school of her parents' choosing. Of the 780 schools in this region of Ghana, 75% are private, for-profit schools. James Tooley's research shows that all of the private schools here outperform the government schools, including Victoria's school, the Supreme Academy. Facilities here are spare, and teacher qualifications are not as strict as in the government school. Milk. But classes are smaller, and the school day lasts a full seven hours. Headmaster Theophilus Quay began his career as a teacher. He founded the Supreme Academy in 2000. There were only 14 students and no desks. Where is Tonky? Where is Tonky? Today, the school has 367 students. He's here all day, every day. For Theophilus Quay, every child is important. In 
small village like this, there are six private schools. Can you imagine that? A small village, six private schools. They're all in competition. They all want to innovate, to improve and raise standards. That's why competition is good. It's good for the parents, good for the children. It's good for the system. People say you've got to have public education. These are the poor people. Public education's got to work there. Some people might say you've got to have private education. But who cares? Let's cut through all that and say what works for the children? What works for the children of the poor? And then we can have a real discussion. Drop your ideological baggage. What I found in this research all over the world, in every single country, is that parents the world over are the same as parents back home. Parents want their children to do well in life. Parents want their children to get a good education. It's as natural as wanting your children to have a meal, to wear clothes. They want the best for their children. It's the same instinct. It's a universal phenomenon that no one can dispute. I follow High in the Andes lay the ruins of the historic royal retreat of the Inca Empire. Hidden from the outside world for centuries, Machu Picchu was rediscovered in 1911. The indigenous people of Peru still farm this valley. Eusebio Mendez Atao and his family live in the small mountain village of El Palomar. They farm the land as did Eusebio's father and grandfather for the last 100 years. They own four bulls, two pigs, and a few chickens. Today, Eusebio hauls his primitive plow up the mountain for another day's work. Still, he holds no legal title to the land on which his livelihood depends. Mis abuelos uh, han sido nacidos acá siempre. Eh, ellos uh, primero han, han, han sido como dueños acá, mis abuelos. One day, a stranger from the city presented Eusebio's grandfather with a title, claiming the land was his. Entonces ya quería votar a, a mis abuelos. Entonces ya, ya, por no dejar el terreno, bueno, si quieres seguir trabajando ese terreno, esa parcela, bueno, ya pues uh, trabaja, entonces para mí, dice, no lo había dicho. Over the centuries, this sacred valley of the Incas has had many owners. Stretching more than 2,000 miles, the empire once controlled the land from Ecuador to southern Chile. Inca kings extracted tributes from local farmers until Spanish conquistadors conquered the land in the 16th century. Since then, Peruvian governments have often dictated land ownership. As a boy, Eusebio had only one option, to work for the man who had claimed ownership of the land. Todo el día tenía que pasear su oveja, entonces mi papá también tenía que trabajar. Tristera, ¿no? La situación a veces no puedo recordar, porque triste ha sido mi sufrimiento a veces cuando Se perdió un, una oveja así en el cerro. A veces eh, el zorro, la, el puma así, se lo comía y a veces no me daba cuenta, como era hartos. Entonces ahí me descuentaba. Entonces. Life is still difficult today. Eusebio rearranges stones in the mountain stream to let the water run through the trenches he has dug. This primitive means of irrigation has been passed from father to son for centuries. This afternoon, Eusebio's sons will help him in the fields. 
Most days, Eusebio and his wife Zenobia work from dawn till dusk. Para mí es mi tierra. El terreno es que se llama como si fuera un, un oro o como si era una una plata, porque de ahí yo como, de ahí come mis hijos. In 1969, the Peruvian government took the land from the large property owners, but instead of distributing it to individual farmers, they established cooperatives, and no individual was allowed to own the land. Once again, Eusebio had only one option. To stay on the land, he and Zenobia would have to work for the cooperative, whose directors were appointed by bureaucrats in the capital of Lima. Entonces seguíamos el peor que los hacendados eran nos explotaban los dirigentes también. No no era sueldo sino salario nomás era diario un sol 50, aún mucho más pues para, para ellos ellos sí to, tomaban cerveza cuando viajaban al Cusco. ¿no? Por ejemplo los dirigentes tienen hasta ahorita su casa su carro, no tractores que tenía la cooperativa se lo han vendido ellos y eso lo que tenían que poner en el banco de la plata y ellos se gozaban con eso. For years, Eusebio and his neighbors fought the system without success. Nearby, Sebastiana Flores farms a small plot of land with her husband and two sons. Another neighbor, Alejandrina Huamande Chavez, farms the land alone. Her husband has left to earn money in the city. In their fight to own property, Eusebio and his neighbors have allies they have never met. Two-thirds of the world's population are locked out of the capitalist system. Four billion people that have no property rights, that have no recognized legal business associations, and no recognized legal means to identify themselves. Hernando de Soto is president of the Institute for Liberty and Democracy, headquartered in Lima. The Economist magazine calls it one of the two most important research organizations in the world. It fights for property rights and the rule of law to ensure that no one gains special treatment from government. Working one-on-one, -on -one, its field researchers pave the way for reform. We all talk about a global economy and a global world. And yet, we know very little about how two-thirds of the world lives. And it is important that we get acquainted with them because they are the majority of the world's population. What you need to participate in the capitalist game are assets. Eusebio's only asset is the land. But without legal title, he cannot get a loan to buy more seed or more land. Without legal title, he cannot borrow to educate his children or improve his home. And without legal title, he cannot benefit from the sale of the property, nor could his father or grandfather. So we've got to understand that either we quickly make capitalism friendly to the majority, or they'll always be on the outside looking in, and every day as they see the disparities of wealth, they'll get angrier and angrier. Había desesperación. Como te digo, como un, en mi sueño, yo quería ver siempre el título. Pero con ese sueño siempre me despertaba en la tarde, en la, en la mañana, en la noche. Igual era para mí. Eusebio's dreams are about the beginning of a series of complex issues. Creating the rule of law is, of course, not a silver bullet. Development is very complex, like life itself. You've got education that's involved. Uh, you've got health that's necessary. You've got enforcement that is all part of it. But if you do not have an order that tells you who owns what, who is where, and who's accountable for what, none of the rest work. Today, Eusebio's village is preparing for a special ceremony. It will begin with a traditional Pachamanga. Pachamanga literally means earth food. The entire meal is cooked over hot stones and under wet straw and earth. A feast like this is reserved for a celebration. And today is a day to celebrate. Reforms set in motion years before are finally beginning to reach the mountain villages of Peru. 
the government has made it possible for individuals to get title to the land. With a signature or a fingerprint, it becomes official. Years, often centuries of waiting, have come to an end. Legal title is theirs at last. With this simple ceremony, lives can now change. Sebastiana will be able to make much needed improvements to her home. Alejandrina's hopes are closer to reality. She will soon get a loan for seed to plant more corn and to help pay for her children's education. Alegre, contenta ahorita como un que está fatigando que sea uno, ¿no? Al ver el título. The title says it all. The land finally belongs to Eusebio and his family. Yo tengo 47 años y recién veo mi, mi título, ¿no? Mis papás ya se han finado ya, pero ellos ya no han visto ya. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias, gracias, gracias. Como te digo, como un, en mi sueño, yo quería ver siempre el título. Carved from the Asian subcontinent after a bloody civil war with Pakistan, this predominantly Muslim nation is the most densely populated on earth, and half of its 140 million citizens are under the age of 20. Constantly threatened by monsoons and flooding, Bangladesh could hardly grow enough food to feed itself for its first 30 years. Today, the capital of Dhaka is a teeming city where commerce is a way of life. When Bangladesh won independence in 1971, more than 70% of its people lived on less than one dollar a day. Hunger and famine haunted almost every village and every family. It was into this world that Minera Begum and Din Islam Hussein were born. When they were only 13, Minera and Din Islam were married in an arranged ceremony. Din Islam had grown up in a village of weavers and had learned the trade. But although he worked hard for others, he could never get ahead himself. Poverty is uh, a, a kind of a darkness around you. You don't see any hope, any ray of hope. Uh, you live every day the same way in the darkness. Uh, you don't have a future. In the early 70s, a young Muhammad Yunus, then an economics professor, left the city to do research in local villages like this one. Here I am teaching elegant theories of economics in the classroom and people are dying uh, outside the classroom and we have nothing to do about it. He found people making many beautiful products, yet they remain desperately poor. To an economist, it didn't make sense. Something was missing. But if you look around, who are the people really working? It's the poor. They work their pants off. Professor Yunus realized that the only way the villagers could buy supplies to create small businesses was with high interest loans from unscrupulous money lenders. There was no other option. And money lenders were imposing very terrible conditionalities on them. Like you have to sell your product to me at the price that I decide, etc. that kind of thing. 
In one village, Muhammad Yunus found that he could provide life-changing loans to 42 people. They would cost a total of $27, an average of 64 cents each. He personally made the loans. And I was shocked. Here we talk about millions of dollars and billions of dollars of development assistance to help the economy grow and so on. We never paid any attention to people who needed such a small amount of money. That was the beginning of an idea that grew into the Grameen Bank, a bank for the rural poor. In the language of Bangladesh, Grameen means rural. It's also the idea for which Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. The business of the Grameen Bank is microcredit, small loans to poor people, enabling them to create businesses of their own. We have a very strange financial system in the world. More than two-thirds of the world population are rejected by the financial system. So it's a system which is limited to very privileged people. Like everyone in their village, Minera and Denislam were far from privileged. They watched as their neighbors prospered from the Grameen bank loans. Finally, they decided to take the risk themselves. The system is unusual and simple. A loan requires no collateral, no legal contract, and 96% of the loans in this mostly Muslim country are made to women. Well, giving loans to women in Bangladesh is not easy. Somehow the religion is interpreted uh, here as women should stay home. So when we tried to give loans to women, a husband became the first uh, opponent of that loan. In time, things changed. Money that went to the family through women brought so much benefit to the families. Women were very cautious with their money. When they start earning income, the children become the first beneficiary of that income. And women had a longer vision. They wanted to build up to something. Men always wanted to enjoy themselves right away rather than uh, wait for future and so on. With Minera's loan from the Grameen Bank, she and Dinislam bought a loom. Dinislam taught Minera to weave, and they began to create Jamdanis, handcrafted traditional saris. It's a difficult business, because the competition is fierce, the work is exacting and rigorous. It takes a week to make each sari. <laughs> But the system is designed to work. Each week, the Grameen borrowers gather in a center meeting to pay their installments directly to a regional Grameen banker and to discuss their common problems. Center meeting brings people together. For them, it's a one opportunity to get to know their neighbors and interact with them. It's a social activity for them. Uh, some people say it's uh, as important as the loan itself. Uh, they never had so many friends before, now they have friends. Key elements of the system are peer pressure and individual pride. Initial loans are always for income producing projects, so there will be money for repayment. Loans are made for livestock, poultry and agriculture, but also for grocery shops, even though traditional Muslim society discourages the participation of women in the marketplace. Loans are even given for cell phones. There are now more than 250,000 Grameen phone ladies throughout Bangladesh. They provide a phone for the village, selling minutes that enable millions to talk with loved ones across the country and around the world. As part of the loan process, borrowers throughout Bangladesh have developed what they call the 16 decisions, crucial elements for living successful, healthy lives. They recite them at every center meeting. They include cleanliness, balanced meals, family planning, and working hard. Loans is, is an excuse, really. They work around that loan and discover themselves and their creativity comes out. It's a really this creativity in the person who changes the life.
A second loan helped Minera and Dinislam improve their home. It now has a tin roof to keep out the monsoon rains, a separate room for the loom, and a well that provides clean water. As tradition here dictates, the men of the family still eat first, but other things are changing. Women having access to uh, finance, access to money, uh, changes everything because now she has the power of money. The Grameen Bank operates in nearly every one of the more than 70,000 rural villages in Bangladesh. There are more than six and a half million borrowers. The loans are still small. The average is only $85. And the payback rate is 99%. In our last count, we see that 56% of the families within Grameen Bank have moved out of poverty. Each week, Dinislam carries Jamdani saris to the Demra market where hundreds of products sell to the highest bidders. It's the first stop for goods that will travel to the capital of Dhaka Very good job, Dani. and around the world. Like millions of others, Minera and Dinislam are now making decisions for themselves. They decide what to make, where to sell, and how much to charge. The future of Bangladesh is bright. Uh, we are hoping that very soon we'll be able to become a poverty-free country. And this hopefully will inspire the whole world to become a poverty-free world. The power of a simple idea has changed lives in Bangladesh. And microcredit has become a global phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes miracles occur in the most unlikely places. This small country has been dominated by its neighbors and denied freedom for most of its history. In the center of its capital, Tallinn, remains one of the best preserved medieval cities in Northern Europe, a testament to what can be created through free trade. Since its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, sweeping economic reforms have transformed Estonia. It's now the most competitive new member of the European Union, and the Wall Street Journal ranks it as one of the freest economies in the world. Joan Norberg is a Swedish author and scholar specializing in global trade issues. A lot of tourists today. Just 15 years ago, this was a poor part of the Soviet communist dictatorship. There were bread lines, 1,000% inflation, but then with the right institutions, democracy, free trade, free markets, suddenly people had the opportunity to improve their lives with entrepreneurial creativity. And now this place is booming with the fastest growth rates in Europe. So it shows the rest of the world that freedom works. In an older neighborhood on the outskirts of Tallinn is the home of one of Estonia's most dramatic success stories. The Estonia Piano Company is now producing an instrument that rivals the finest pianos on the market. People everywhere are entrepreneurs. They want to produce, buy and sell things because they want to improve their lives for themselves and for their families. And Estonians have always done that. They were creative, entrepreneurial up until the communist occupation. For 50 years, Estonia was ruled by the Soviet Union, its economy stifled by the central control of production and distribution. Although Estonians won their independence from Russia after the First World War, 
they lost it again to the Soviets during the second. In those bleak times, the Estonia Piano Company manufactured instruments only for the Soviet republics. Like most young Estonian men, Uramas Uranorm was drafted into the Soviet army. Today, he's a master craftsman, but still remembers the hardships of his youth. Janus Randvir is also a master piano craftsman. He has worked at the Estonia Piano Company for 45 years. He will never forget the Soviet era. Selle aeg see tärksad inimesed oli isali ka niukune. Viidi ära, lihtsalt viidi ära. Oli oma, oma kaks kolmeist aastat metsatöödil ja kaevandustes ja, ja Siberis. Ma olin kaheksanda klassi pois, kui ma praktiliselt esimest korda nägin isa. For a company here in Estonia, before the reforms, they were stuck in a planned economy. It was impossible for them to get the kind of goods, the supplies that they needed. With the abolishment of price controls, of protectionism, of communism, suddenly this entrepreneurial spirit springs up and creates magical wonders. But even with Estonia's new independence and the eventual success of painful economic reforms, the Estonia Piano Company and its craftsmen remained trapped in the past. For 40 years, they had built pianos exclusively for the state. Standards were low, but it was a steady business. They were forced to buy most of their materials from within the Soviet Union, and they could only sell pianos within the Soviet Union. There was no competition, no incentive. Tegime vanu klavereid ja oli vaja hoida töölisi. Vene turg äkki kadus ära. The instruments were sturdy, but hardly world class. Production dropped from 500 pianos a year to a low of 49 in 1994. The National Concert Hall in Tallinn. Urmas is here with his daughter, Trin. He's on assignment. Indrek Laul, concert pianist and graduate of the Juilliard School of Music is practicing for a performance. He's playing a new Estonia piano and Urmas is here to ensure it's in perfect condition. Urmas, but Indrek Laul is not just any concert pianist. As a young man in Estonia, he worked at the piano factory demonstrating new instruments for customers. As the company continued to struggle and the value of its shares continued to drop, Indrik bought as much stock as he could. In 2003, he gained controlling interest in the troubled company. He's now its president. When he took over, his daunting task was to keep the company alive. His answer was quality. Piano is bought once in a lifetime. And so they want to get the most beautiful piano sound, the most beautiful quality piano they can get. I thought that the best we can do is offer the most quality instrument we can make. Centrally planned economies don't work because you can only get people to do the same old thing, to repeat what they've already done, the same old piano, for example. What you need is the new entrepreneurs, the innovators with strange new ideas who come in from the side, like this guy who comes with a brilliant idea for a new piano, introduces hundreds of changes, and then suddenly is going global, selling all over the world. Today, the Estonia piano benefits from the finest quality imports and techniques from around the world. Wood for the soundboard comes from the cold climates of Switzerland and Austria. Slow growing trees make narrow rings that help carry the sound. Keys are carved from spruce, making them light and sensitive. The keys are the driving force of the piano action, which is imported from Germany. All the bass strings are handmade at the factory. Copper wire adds width, which lowers the tone. Master craftsmen shape and soften the hammers until the sound is rich and concentrated. 
Every piano is broken in by this unique machine. The strings are stretched. It is then sent for tuning and voicing. Now in a new free Estonia, having abolished all the tariffs and become a part of the global economy, it's possible for an Estonian piano company, for example, to buy the best goods, the best supplies, the best material from whichever source it happens to be wherever in the world. Then they can also improve their goods and sell it to the rest of the world. We still have 88 keys and uh, the amount of strings we have on the piano is the same. Everything else has been changed. It's a completely different instrument what it was. To help save the company, Indrik enlisted the help of his father, Venno Laul. An internationally known choir director, Venno works alongside the craftsmen, supervising the many changes and ensuring quality. During World War II, he was only five years old when the Germans imprisoned his father and executed him. Kui me saime vabaks, siis oli see niivõrd suur muutus kogu meie ühiskonnale, et me esialgu ei saanud kui võib-olla aru, mida alanud uus aeg meile tähendab. Alles nüüd maailma avanades meie jaoks. Meil on ka kaupa, mida suurte maailma saata. Estonia pianos are now sold worldwide and rank close to Steinway in quality at about half the price. We can clearly see that the great benefit of free trade is cheaper goods, which means that consumers, they gain from it. But we often forget that the workers also gain so much. Estonia klaver on sellepärast nii hea, et ta on tehtud käsitööna. Ja sellepärast, et mina, mina teen selle klaveri. Et kui keegi klavereid ei osta, siis minu elu ka ei lähe hästi. Et loomulikult on see hea, kui Estonia klavereid müüaks igal pool maailmas, sellepärast, et siis palgapäev on hea päev. Ja... We have created the Estonia sound. It's like no other piano sound you can find. It has that deep, romantic, rich tone that for me represents not only Estonia piano making, but also Estonia musical culture. I don't think without free trade, our company would even exist right now. Julgeks siin öelda küll kõigile rahvastele, kes veel ei ole saavutanud vabadust ja vabakaubandust. Et see on eesmärk ja see on ideaal, mille nimel ei ole küll liiga suur ükski ohver. Selle nimel on tasunud elada, et seda kogeda. In only 25 years, more than 400 million Chinese have climbed out of deep poverty, where they were living on less than one dollar a day. Shanghai, often called the head of the dragon, is a dramatic symbol of the fastest growing major economy in world history. Little more than a dozen years ago, the financial district of Pudong was swampy farmland. Today, hundreds of thousands work in skyscrapers, some among the tallest in the world. Designer boutiques line the city's streets, and Shanghai is a destination for tourists and business travelers from across China and around the world. The World Bank says average real incomes in China rose 440% in just 20 years. It would seem that communist China is using free trade to reinvent itself. For much of the 20th century, it was a poor country. 
and under Chairman Mao, private property and private business were illegal. Even today, new ideas flooding into China's cities mix uneasily with ancient cultural traditions. Everything is changing, especially personal expectations. Merrill Lynch estimates that there are at least 300,000 millionaires in China. There are 10 Ferrari dealerships. It's Ferrari's fifth largest market in the world. People are now able to use their imaginations and intelligence to create more options for themselves and to get paid for their hard work. China has become the world's third largest trading nation. Zhang Jun is an economics professor at Fudan University. I think this is a great country. I think the, especially you know, for after the rapid economic development and, and making the country rich today, I think the majority of the Chinese are proud of being Chinese. It's a totally different picture uh, you know, for 15 years ago. So it's a big change. The Chinese government openly encourages the free market and aggressively courts foreign investment. Government development zones are springing up throughout the country. Sun Yan Yan is the promotion director for the Suzhou Industrial Park near Shanghai. It's a partnership between China and Singapore. We provide a kind of platform like a facility and also offer low rental and to encourage them to developing faster. And if they need any people, we will help them to recruit nationwide. Young people are flocking to the wealthy eastern coastal areas in search of jobs. These managers often retreat to the nearby mountains to brainstorm new ideas. One of the top managers in the company, called Snail Game, is E.O. Zhang. His nickname is Yo-Yo. The owner of the company is Sher Hai. He's 34 years old. In his search for talent, he has hired young people like Yo-Yo from across China. Within two years, they expect to be listed on the NASDAQ exchange in New York. The nearby Buddhist shrine has as much attraction for Sher Hai today as it did when he first visited this mountain lake park as a child. These entrepreneurs are navigating a path between China's cultural traditions and their bold new ideas. I think the free market gives the sense that, you know, they, they are really the part of the economy. You know, this is not an economy by the party, by the government. This is the economy of everyone. Yo-Yo often spends his afternoons with his camera. His photographs will soon take on a new life. The office of Snail Game is here in the Suzhou Industrial Park. Yo-Yo is the art director. Snail Game was one of China's first internet gaming companies. They believe their 3D animation engines are the best in China. Yo-Yo's ship is destined to become part of an adventure. The artists create virtual worlds complete with life and death challenges. From their imaginations, they develop every object and every character in this virtual world. The company has 120 game developers and maintains 20 sales offices across China. Because of the Chinese economy has been changed so fast, it created a lot of opportunities for the small companies to merge and to expand. Sher Hai's home is more traditional than the virtual worlds he creates at Snail Game. He and his wife, Jo, have known each other since high school. They have two young sons. Together, they created Snail Game in 2000. Their older son is just starting school. His childhood is very different from that of his father. Sher Hai's parents worked in a factory at a time when there were many shortages. Sher Hai and other children often had to stand in line for food rations. So, in the child, it gave us a feeling that every thing is very precious. 都是很很难得到的。我们很难想象为什么以前
那些物资都那么的匮乏，而现在不同了，所以我想这就是一个一个经济的力量。Shanghai represents the success of the new China. Still, much of the country lags far behind, especially in the vast rural areas. Many of the young people at Snail Game have moved from the poor countryside and cannot afford housing. They live in a dormitory financed by the company. Despite industrial problems in many parts of China, unemployment, poor working conditions, and long hours. These young entrepreneurs epitomize the explosive potential of modern China. Shirhai and Zhou work hard and take risks. Both go to snail game every day, where Zhou is the chief financial officer. The industrial park has simplified the bureaucratic process so much that a business license can be obtained in just a week or two. This is a domestic creative business here in China. But recently, they are developing well because the market demand is quite good. Their competition is international, but much of the market is in their backyard. Throughout Asia, gamers pack internet cafes to play online games. Tens of thousands play at the same time, and they can do it from anywhere in the world. Here in China. The number of people playing internet games has risen 51 percent in just one year. The gaming business is intensely competitive. At this stage of development, I think the majority of the Chinese believe that competition is a good thing because in the past we didn't really have the competition. You know, all the industry being monopolized by by the government, but now I think the competition provides more opportunities for the consumer. You know, for everyone. Still, its people face immense challenges: pervasive corruption, deep poverty in the countryside, and an underdeveloped legal system. They also face the complex question of whether this new economic freedom will lead to political freedom. This, this is a very sensitive question. Sensitive topic. I think it's like this. Is that, um, China is such a country. 呃，它跟西方不太一样。你看，我们几几千年的一个文明，它整个一个发展，嗯，从某种意义上，人们更需要一些框架式的东西。嗯，它不像美国，它可能需要更有框架式的，而不是完全开放式的。The oldest continuous civilization in the world. China has remained intensely self-reliant and innately entrepreneurial. So, we, this generation, it is like the Japan War after the War. They must be able to do something that the previous generation has not done or that they cannot do. And this effort is continuous. It is like running the Olympic Games. We, this generation, Around the world, there are enormous and complicated challenges ahead, but extraordinary change can happen when ordinary people have the tools and the freedom to make their own decisions. In a poor village in sub-Saharan Africa, a child's mind is opening. And her world will never be the same. The children of the world are the future of the world. That's why they're so precious to us. That's why they need the best. High in the Peruvian Andes, a simple but legal ceremony marks a new beginning in the lives of these poor farmers. With it comes pride of ownership and the promise of new opportunity. Two thirds of the world's population, four billion people, are locked out of the capitalist system. It's important to let them in. In thousands of villages throughout Bangladesh, one man's bold idea has unlocked the power of the poor. Micro lending has become a global phenomenon and a recognized force for world peace. It's amazing to see how a small amount of loan, like fifty dollar, hundred dollar, can change a person's life. The whole family gets out of poverty. And everywhere, the spirit and drive of individual entrepreneurs is creating more options. And breathing new life into old cultures.
My hope is that people's fate and their future should not be decided from where they happen to be born, but by their own abilities, their own will, their own interests, their dreams and their visions. The ultimate resource is people, skilled, spirited and hopeful people who are exerting their wills and imaginations for their own benefit and inevitably they will benefit not only themselves but the rest of the world as well. Major funding for this program has been provided by the Barney Family Foundation and the Green Children Foundation.